summit is likely to take place in Nairobi, and the Secretariat will now, having had the commitment of both the African Union leaders and the CARICOM heads of government, um, will now move to prepare the formal arrangements for that summit. And to that extent, we would also seek to operationalize. Many of you would have seen in December when we were at the ACP summit that the Kenyans have graciously offered CARICOM and member states um, accommodation for a CARICOM office. Many of the people of the region may not know that Nairobi actually hosts the largest amount of UN offices in the Southern Hemisphere. And to that extent, it is also the headquarters of the United Nations Environmental Program, which is absolutely critical to the countries of the region who are on the front line of the climate crisis. And also, it is the whole headquarters to UN Habitat, which deals with housing issues. And as you know, one of the first things we have to do, or we are doing rather, with respect to fighting the climate crisis and building our resilience is changing how we build in order to ensure that our houses are far more resilient. And perhaps that is the bridge that I will use to pass over to my brother, Roosevelt Skerritt, because he more than most have known what it is to have to change how you do things in order to become more resilient and to withstand the vagaries of climate in today's world. Roosevelt. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, let me greet all of you, the media. Um, I will first speak not about uh, an external matter because um, Haiti is a member of CARICOM and we do not consider matters of Haiti to be of a foreign relation um, uh, existence. But heads spent uh, the entire caucus period this morning discussing the situation in Haiti. We had an opportunity uh, to review the situation there. And we recognize that this situation is very complex in nature. And um, the issues there are also of a complex nature as well. And in discussing, we also recognize that there are many different views on the way forward. But we all accepted the situation cannot continue uh, with no uh, intervention um, on the part of CARICOM. And in that regard, we've agreed uh, to dispatch a team of senior officials led by the Secretary General, Ambassador Larocque, uh, to visit Haiti and to meet with all relevant stakeholders so that we can find um, some kind of, first of all, to know exactly what's happening on the ground, engaging stakeholders, but also seeking to devise a strategy of how CARICOM can assist Haiti in resolving this issue. Because if we, it is felt that if we do not help address the domestic issue confronting Haiti, we will continue to have tremendous negative impacts on countries like the Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas, um, who are seeing a, a a large number of, of um, migrants coming in uh, to these countries and, and creating some, some domestic challenges for them. So, so we need to work with Haiti, we need to work with the, with the various stakeholders in Haiti um, to, to find some kind of lasting solution uh, to the current impasse. We also had the opportunity to receive and to welcome the Foreign Minister of Canada. Unfortunately, as you know, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada uh, could not have been with us, um, taking into consideration uh, some domestic challenges um, which he has. But nonetheless, we're pleased to receive the Honorable Francois Philippe Chapin, um, who set out an agenda for the strengthening of ties between his country and CARICOM. Uh, we have said, we said to them that we felt that the relationship almost appeared to be on pause, and, and therefore we need to bring some new life uh, to the relationship between uh, Canada and CARICOM because we have had a very long uh, beneficial relationship between Canada and CARICOM for extended periods of time, even before our own independence. And um, we also express our appreciation uh, for the assistance granted by Canada in, in various fields. And we look forward to 
the initiatives proposed by the foreign minister to advance relations. Um, yeah. It, they, Canada has also um, made an offer to host a Canada CARICOM summit in May 2020 in Canada, and of which CARICOM has um, graciously accepted. Uh, so we're hoping that this is a clear sign of more political engagement uh, between CARICOM and Canada. We congratulated Guyana on its assumption of the chairmanship of the Group of 77 and China, and we assured Guyana of the required support and, and accepted Guyana's expression of appreciation. And um, the, uh, the upcoming Third South Summit in April 2022, 2020 sorry, in Uganda, under the chairmanship of Guyana, is expected to set the tone of enhancing the unity and cohesion of the group. We believe that the um, Group of 77 and China is a very important uh, entity uh, for the furtherance of CARICOM causes, and, and our participation is very important, and therefore we, we see the assumption of chairmanship by Guyana as a very important step in the direction. Um, heads also, heads of government also reiterated um, our concern over the enhanced sanctions announced <coughs> by the U.S. government under the Title III of the Helms-Burton Act, which strengthened the U.S. economic, commercial, and financial embargo against Cuba. The heads denounced as unjustifiable the application of laws and measures of an extraterritorial nature that are contrary to international law. Heads of government also expressed their deep appreciation uh, for the medical assistance provided by Cuba to member states of the community over the years and help, that helped build the health sectors to, to the benefit and well-being of our people. The heads of government also acknowledged that of their own first knowledge, the person sent had added tremendous value to helping our citizens. The heads of government rejected the statement that this medical assistance given by the Cubans was a form of human trafficking. Uh, we felt that the assistance that we've been getting from Cuba by way of the medical uh, personnel could not be considered uh, to be human trafficking of any form. We also dealt with relations with the Commonwealth Secretariat and the heads of government expressed um, our gratitude for the range of activities undertaken by the Commonwealth Secretariat, whose added value redounded to the benefit of small island and low-lying coastal developing states. And the heads of government further expressed our overwhelming support for the renewal of the term of office of the Secretary General. And we do hope that when we meet in Rwanda, um, the current holder of the post of Secretary General uh, will receive um, the uh, uh, second term in, in that very important office. And we um, also engaged her um, directly and frankly on the issues in the media, and we have accepted the, the responses given to us by her um, as, as being um, um, legitimate responses. Did I miss anything else? No. Um, I think, Chair, these are the... This is from Kevin Barbie. This, that's all the way. Okay. You, you may continue. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I act on instructions, you know, so... <laughs> that's what a big brother tells a little sister all the time. <laughs> Heads of government um, also congratulated Barbados on its uh, selection to host the fifth quadrennial United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which will be held in, in, in that member state from 18 to 23rd October 2020. Uh, heads of government also noted that the conference would be preceded by two ministerial meetings on small island, low lying developing states and least developed countries on the 15th and 18th October 2020. I want to, to end by commending the 
the, the, the chairmanship and the leadership of our chairman, Prime Minister Barbados, Honorable Mayor Motley. I, I must say many of us came here with very low energy, um, but she was able to ignite um, some high energy spirits within us um, to the point where she was able to resurrect a, a number of um, documents and, and decisions uh, which have been um, on our shelves for, for extended periods of time. I mean, the Rosal Declaration, which she referenced, uh, was approved uh, first in 2003 and subsequently in 2007. And we had not spoken about the Rosal Declaration since 2007 until 2020. And, and I'm hoping that um, we can find a way of giving life to it uh, when we meet in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in, in July of this year. And my respectful view is that if we can find common ground on this Rosal Declaration, it would address in large measure um, the deficiency in implementation which we've had at CARICOM for its entire lifetime. And, and I look forward to this meeting in, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where we can advance this, this, this issue very much. So, Prime Minister, on behalf of all of us, we want to say publicly, um, thanks for your chairmanship and, and, and the very, very important two days uh, for the regional integration process and for CARICOM and for the citizens and residents of our community. Thank you, um, Prime Minister Scare. I would just say that, like everything else in life, life is about process, and building an integration movement is as much about process as it is substance. This meeting was, in every respect, a working meeting, and has allowed us to add serious value and to move the needle with respect to almost every issue that we had to deal with here today. And therefore, against that background, as you thank me, I can only say to you that this is only possible because member states have come with the will for us to move forward, generally speaking, the needle to ensure that we can provide more tangible benefits to our individual citizens. So I make the floor available. Esther, you want to add anything? Any questions? Let's just say any, any, okay. any questions. questions. Identify, identify yes, please, as usual, I see familiar faces. Just identify yourself and the media house and I'm sure there are many questions to be asked. Prime Minister Motley, uh, Shane Jones from CBC News in Barbados. Um, you spoke of a comprehensive report uh, received from the regional uh, private sector um, that dealt with things like the, the, the regional food import bill and savings of over 400 uh, million US dollars. Um, my question is, were any suggestions made on, in terms of an overall ease of business in the, in the region from the private sector? Yes, um, that was one of the things that we are looking at. Um, indeed, I just opened the book to the exact page, which is a feat given that it is over 200 pages. Um, so that is a case of divine intervention. But we agreed that the inclusion of the ease of doing business indicators is absolutely critical to any successful investment on the part of the private sector. And each of us has our role to play. And they, will, they have identified the potential areas where they believe that they can participate in order to have this savings of about 400 million US in import bill. And at the same time, they have identified the areas where they believe that whether it is in model legislation for animal and plant health, or whether it is in um, how we deal with the protocols governing inspection and approval procedures for the trade in animal products and um, animals, or whether it is in other trade protocols, we have to be able to remove a lot of the, or to simplify, not remove, simplify a lot of the bureaucratic difficulties without compromising the public purpose. In, in, in Barbados, I use four questions to help us identify how we are going to deconstruct and reconstruct and that is asking yourself, what is really the public purpose you're trying to defend? What is the public mischief that you're fighting against? Can you use technology to do this more effectively? 
and who are the beneficiaries or the classes that are likely to be discriminated against. And in every instance, I can say that based on what the private sector has asked us, we will have to be able to make those determinations to see how best country by country by country, but we recognize that in some instances, we have a Caribbean Agricultural Health and Safety Association already, CAFSA, and that we may need, instead of creating new institutions, to better amplify the role of CAFSA and to ensure that it has the resources to be able to do what is necessary for seamless trade um, across the entire community. Uh, Prime Minister, good evening. Barry Allen from the Nation newspaper here in Barbados. Uh, we spoke to Prime Minister Rowley. Your, your voice is so gentle that I think <coughs> that you may be elsewhere. <laughs> we spoke to Prime Minister Rowley earlier today and he gave us a little snippet uh, regarding the fact that you guys had thoroughly discussed a way forward with which member states could deal with crime and violence and social disruption. Would you be willing to elaborate a little bit well, on what conclusions you reached, if any? Yeah. As I said, we will have a summit in the very near future. But I think that the fundamental point is this, that you cannot solve this problem purely through law enforcement. And that we recognize that the source of the problem is a broader societal problem that requires a societal solution of which the government is only but one of the players. And we're talking about not just how do you solve murders, we're really talking about how do you solve, resolve violence and conflict within our families, within our communities, within our countries. And to that extent, we also recognize that there are some insidious things happening. You're going to hear us talk more about it in Barbados over and over, and some of my ministers have already been given the task. How many people in this room know what purple drank is or lean? How many people in the media who are questioning us? What is purple drank? What is lean? And you are on the front line of the media. This is perhaps one of the worst things that's happening throughout the region. It's one of the negative things that they have taken up from, as we would say, over and away. And all it is is cough syrup, Jolly Ranchers, and Sprite. And regrettably, too many of our young children are using it. And in using it, it literally makes them go into being a different person. That the level of sugar, I'm told, when going into the bloodstream, combined with the codeine and the other things, is having a deleterious impact. And in some instances, people don't even remember what they were doing when they were high. Now, I am old enough to know, as are many in this room, that we have gone through bad epidemics before in terms of drugs. We went through the crack epidemic in the early 80s, mid 80s, and we came out. But we have to work together across the region, first with the parents, so that the parents can recognize what are the threats to their children's stability and do something about it. Now at the end of the day, a child who is high, a young person who is high, and who is not in full control of their capacities may end up doing something that they would not do if they were not. And if they have access to weapons, which regrettably are all too available in our societies today, then what they might have done 30 years ago with a rock or a piece of two by three, they are now doing today with automatic weapons. And that is the insidious nature of what we're confronting. The fact that the majority of you in the media still didn't know what it was tells you that it is still very much, and if I learned about it from 11 and 12 year olds. I must confess, okay? And it is only in going around in the last few weeks and trying to understand what is happening that you begin to recognize that this thing is a serious issue. And unlike other drugs that may bring you down, this one apparently does even stranger things 
to the young people or the human beings that are affected. And I, I see one or two of you nodding because um, you obviously know. And what can be more innocent than Jolly Ranchers and Hard Candy? Bad for you from a point of view of health, but we never associated it as a substance which, when abused, could lead to all kinds of psychotropic behavior and other types of activities that flow from um, drug abuses. Okay, So we're going to have this summit. We recognize that our young people may also be influenced more, in some instances, by pastors who are charismatic, by sportsmen, by artists, by teachers, by nurses, by doctors, by other people in the community who run cultural groups or community groups. Sometimes children can't speak to their parents. So that we feel that we have to have a multidisciplinary approach, I'd like to call and reference the example of Bermuda. Bermuda shared, and the deputy premier is here, they shared, having gone through really bad episodes with crime, having spent hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars bringing in advice from outside. At the end of the day, it is a homegrown, multi-sectoral approach. There's a lot of fancy language to say you got to care. One that picks up those children who are being put out of school at 16 instead of leaving them on the street. One that looks at those families who are falling through the cracks. One that teaches our children how to be able to resolve conflict without wanting to resort to violence to be able to do so. But it is only going to happen when we do this according to scale. In order to transform the society, you need scale. And to that extent, therefore, what the prime ministers and heads of government have agreed is that we need to bring everybody together, set a common mission. And once we set that common mission, then each work their part to pursue and achieve that mission. And therefore, it cannot be government alone, but all of the, what do we call it, the um, partners, the regional multi-state partners, and civil society generally. Okay? Any more questions? Hi, yes. Uh, good evening. Jerome Sawyer from R News in the Bahamas. I wanted to reference uh, your deliberations on Haiti. Uh, specifically, are you able to give us any idea on what you're hoping that mission or the fact finding mission to Haiti might achieve? Also, you may have alluded to the fact that there were some differing opinions or even disagreements on a way forward for Haiti. Are you able to? share with us what they may have been, and specifically for us, what the Bahamas' position might be, as we are one of two countries you mentioned that really uh, feels the impact from unrest in Haiti. Um, Prime Minister Skerritt answered it. I don't think, there, there were no different positions on Haiti. I think that our sensitivity is that we need, and I spoke to President Moyes this morning, we need to ensure that the Secretariat is allowed to come in there with a fact-finding mission. We recognize that there is instability that is not only affecting the well-being of the people of Haiti, but it is now having an impact on the people of the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos. And we recognize that, therefore, the first thing we need to do is to have clarity as to what is transpiring, um, what is causing it, how it can be resolved, and at the same time, to be able to work as a community to minimize the negative impact of persons putting their life at risk. Because if you go in a small boat with some of the swells that we have seen across the region recently, people are going to die. And then those who don't die don't know what they're going to face when they go to another country where they are literally hiding and trying to literally survive and they have no means of easy and ready survival. So this is not an easy issue, it's a complex issue and Prime Minister Skerritt has made that clear. But the first step is for us to have the legitimacy of and the integrity of facts that we can rely upon and that therein after we then work with the relevant players to see how best we can, one, work with Haiti to
to ensure that they don't face instability within their boundaries, and two, that as a result, there are no negative consequences to the people of the Bahamas or to the Turks and Caicos. And, you know, I've been around long enough to know that difficult discussions are not often welcome, but they are, at the end of the day, what are necessary in order to be able to gain progress and to move forward. And I'm satisfied the Haitian foreign minister came this morning. We were able to engage with him as a whole. I was also able to speak at a personal level to President Moyes. The heads are engaged. We will be meeting again for the CARICOM Mexico summit in three weeks time. And therefore we anticipate that before then, the Secretariat will be able to give us the results of the fact-finding mission, which will have, along with the Secretary General, um, officials from Bahamas, Jamaica, and Barbados with the Secretary General. Roosevelt, I don't know if you want to add to that. I mean, I, I echo the, the, the sentiments, uh, Chairman. Uh, the, the number of, of players in the Haitian situation. So it's not only the government, you have the private sector, you have civil society, you have uh, a, a, a number of opposition parties involved. And, and, and so unless we have the facts, one cannot determine what is the, the way forward. Um, and we have to be very careful as a community that we do not um, delegate our responsibility to Haiti. Um, and we must not appear in any way to have what has become in many parts of the world Haiti fatigue. And, and we recognize that Haiti is part of the community, and we have a responsibility and a duty and an obligation uh, to assist in a member state in unraveling its challenges and to work with them uh, towards lasting solutions. But that finding a solution to the present impasse will not solve Haiti's problems for the future. And therefore, we need to engage Haiti and indeed the international community on the economic and social development of Haiti and, and to look at the fiscal challenges confronting Haiti, the issues of debt, the issues of development, and, and to work with Haiti in, in developing a, a strategy that would bring lasting economic and social uh, transformation to Haiti, including healthcare, including education and training, et cetera. Any other questions? Mary Claire Williams, CMC News. Um, you said that you would be um, giving more attention to the question of um, free movement of, um, of skilled nationals. Do you? Can you um, elaborate on that and um, exactly what are some of the issues that you all will be dealing with? I know there have been concerns about the amount of red tape that, um, that nationals have to go through to resettle in, um, in another country. As we indicated, um, extensive work was mm -hmm. done um, on the free movement of, of, of labor throughout the Caribbean community. And in this document, we had suggested that we have the, we have everybody captured, every category captured in this. As you know, we started on a phase basis with university graduates, et cetera, and, and we're coming down the ladder. And it was always felt that we must not let the Caribbean citizens believe that it, is, it would be only a selected few who would enjoy this fundamental right of movement. And, and so there was not only a recommendation for all categories to be considered, 
but this also spoke about a procedure in managing this movement and also it dealt with contingent rights. Um, the issue of contingent rights was always a contentious issue and uh, what we have decided at this meeting, uh, especially considering the intervention by the private sector and the labor movement, uh, to bring this document back to the table. And that document um, came about from a wide cross-section of consultations with the private sector, civil society, the trade unions, uh, member states. And, and so we will bring it back to, to heads. We intend to re-engage the stakeholders so we can freshen up the document if we have to. And it will be presented uh, two heads at the meeting in St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, for the heads consideration. But we maintain that the free movement is central to the integration process, integration movement. And as we have seen, the fear of um, half of a country moving to the other has not happened. Um, obviously, in these things, you'll always have administrative challenges in certain member states from time to time. And in large measure, it is not that the government does not have the system in place or the legislation in place. It's always about personalities. And, and therefore, it's important for us to separate um, systems um, from personalities and legislation from personalities. Um, so, let us look at it, and of course, we will engage you, the media, on this, because you're an important um, stakeholder, and so that you can share your views on this document and on the issue of free movement uh, within the Caribbean community. I'd just like to add to that, too, that on that matter, we'd like to thank the government and people of Jamaica for their um, generous offer to be able to operationalize assistance to member states with respect to technical and vocational education and training covering tuition assessment and certification, and also um, equipment with ultraviolet lights that will allow us to be able to better determine whether a certificate is fraudulent or not. Um, so these things all add up. In our own case in Barbados, we would have spoken to the fact that we have shifted the burden of proof where we are prepared to be able to give the applicant the benefit of the doubt pending a more thorough due diligence of the certificate. But in so doing, should the certificate turn out to be fraudulent, it will be revoked. Um, and, and the reality is that 99% of the certificates received are in good order. So that if you have a lengthy process that makes people wait, there's really no reason for it. Similarly, we have a security system, I referred to it earlier, the Joint Regional Communication Center, that allows us to be able to do checks against Interpol and other databases, security databases, to see whether there are issues that we need to be aware of. And um, that is a major, of major assistance to individual territories. So against those backgrounds, there ought not to be the kind of bureaucracy or on the other hand, angst on the part of the applicant because it should be a far more seamless environment. And finally, to underscore Prime Minister Skerritt's point, we've had freedom of movement in a number of key categories for years now, and it has done nothing to destroy our societies. I want to reiterate that part of the difficulty in the region is that we just do not have enough people coming to work every day working to add value, to pay taxes, to secure growth. And it is a conversation that we are going to have to continue to have within the region and to manage the migration far better than we're doing. We have had a fairly extensive presentation and there's one more. Yes. Good evening, Wendy Burke, Starcom Network. We spoke of giving support to the Commonwealth Secretariat in the upcoming election, but we know that there were also others here seeking CARICOM support in their bids um, for election, Canada and also the OAS. Can you tell us if a position has been made on those other two? 
Well, there was nobody from the OAS seeking support here today, so we can dismiss that once and for all. In respect of Canada, Canada, Ireland, and Norway have all approached us, not just this meeting, but in the last meeting, um, because of their bids for Security Council. These things happen all the time. Um, St. Vincent, as you know, is the smallest country in the world ever to be elected to the Security Council. And those are things that are par for the course. Um, with respect to the Commonwealth Secretary General, the situation is slightly different. Um, Bar the Baron of Scotland is and has been the candidate proposed by a member state, Dominica, um, and Antigua, I believe, on the last occasion. Belize. And Belize. Belize. And um, I wish I was there, because if I was there, Barbados would have, been, would have been one of the proposers, too. So I say that for the record. And we are happy with the work, as Prime Minister Skerritt said, that she has done for the countries of the region. We are happy for the work she has done for the countries in the Pacific and Africa. And we believe that every other Commonwealth Secretary General who has performed, and not even perhaps as much, has had the benefit of a second term. And therefore, we overwhelmingly support her re-election. Thank you very much. That's it. <laughs>